All right. So last time we were talking about the testing frameworks and kind of actually applying best practices to a testing framework. And I'm using my test, uh, the code that gets generated from my test generator tool as our example. Last time we covered all the different components that go into the actual building of the test suites, the test scripts, uh, your data sets, the different property files, uh, and actually building your test suites. Uh, this time we're gonna look at the uh, more of the framework side versus the testing side which is more of the backbone that goes into actually building your test framework for actually implementing or uh, uh, testing your code of your web-based applications. <clears throat> so the first thing I want to point out is uh, I have applied best practices. So throughout my code, I have removed most hard-coded uh, strings and I've moved them out to a message.properties file and I'm controlling controlling all the hard-coded values uh, from here. Uh, with that being said, there is also a corresponding uh, messages and a message key mapper uh, in the framework itself. So I have this message key, which maps to the message properties file. So bit 32, there's a corresponding bit 32 in here. Uh, these are all uh, final strings. So these can be used anywhere within the application. And then we have the messages Java, which is essentially just our resource uh, bundler that will load our resource file in the memory at the start of the application uh, or at the start of our testing when we run our tests. So this really, uh, I saw a huge decrease in the amount of overhead from Java strings uh, by going this route. So if you have not actually implemented something like this in a larger application and you have a lot of hard-coded strings throughout your project, highly recommend you look at this. You will see a performance improvement. And also you get away from having typos uh, for accidentally typing the wrong thing somewhere uh, or copying and pasting problems that you might have. Uh, so that's the message keys and the resources. The overall framework, <clears throat> in uh, my tool, I start out by, I actually generate uh, a whole bunch of generated code that the users can use, but the layout is essentially the same uh, following most uh, testing standards or most Maven uh, standards. So you have an assertions package. This will contain all your interfaces and implementations of your assertion classes, where you test the actual true and false values of a test, what passes, what fails, uh, and when do you want to actually kick out of the code. This is also where you create your custom uh, actual test, um, your assertions in here, where's a good one? Um, ah, order detail, here we go. So here you can look for things like uh, on this particular page, uh, we have something called expected fee data. So as you're actually adding products to the application, you will see uh, the fees get displayed on the right hand side. So I can call this guy here. And if that particular action of the page uh, fails, then it will actually write out a custom um, failed message. So the assertions, classes here are essentially used where you actually control the output that your test generates when a test fails. Now you can just let the application throw an exception and you can write the exception out to the screen. And for most actions, when you're actually trying to perform something or actually do a test like click a button uh, or actually try to do something on the page that maybe uh, add things to a shopping cart. If those fail, you will want to throw different exceptions. But if you actually want to test if the page is loaded, if particular labels are displayed correctly, uh, or if, say, for example, uh, you do a transaction and you should see a message at the top of the screen, this is where you could apply that. This is where you actually create the custom messaging for that. Uh, and of course, all these extend your default from our generated code. And we'll get into that in a second. Uh, next, we have our builders. So the builders are essentially used for your data mappers. So here we 
take, uh, let's look at our order detail one again. So order detail, we have our generic builder here, which essentially contains all the different paths that you can load data into your uh, test cases. Uh, so this is where we're actually applying all the mappers for loading the data from an external source, be it a, a JSON file, a spreadsheet file. Um, so you could do a, just a standard spreadsheet uh, row data, you could pull it in from a spreadsheet with a workbook uh, and a sequence number or a JIRA issue. Or you could pull in from a worksheet within a workbook and a JIRA issue. So I've kind of given you three options. So you could actually go through your own spreadsheet, pass in a row, and it will map it from the row. You could do it from a workbook level. Uh, if you only had one sheet by default, it would take this. Uh, or if you have multiple worksheets within a workbook, you can pull them in from here. Uh, I also read from a JSON file. Uh, there is a JSON mapper. It's not fully functional yet, but um, right now JSON actually handles most JSON along with JSON. And then I have this random data here, which actually uses um, Java Faker to actually generate real looking uh, data. Uh, it's needs a little tweaking, but right now uh, it will give you uh, pretty clear test data, just maybe not for like first name, last name. You would have to do a little bit more customization with this if you actually want to have real data that applies to an actual test field. And then if we go into each one, uh, so like if we go into the JSON reader, um, it's again all extending from our generated code, and we'll look at that here. But essentially, everything here is a wrapper. So you, everything I generate, you can wrap and extend and add your own code to it without touching the generated code. Uh, reason for this is within my tool, you can rerun the tool at any time, and it will only touch the generated code. So anything you create custom within your application or your test framework here, won't be impacted by changes to the actual framework. Uh, under controllers, this is actually where we, uh, where is the custom order, okay, order controller. So in here, uh, this is just uh, <clears throat> our controller. It will return us our builders, our assertions, uh, to where we can actually uh, choose which uh, option we want to use if we want to build something. Uh, test or actually uh, use some page actions. The data objects, uh, these are all the custom data objects that you can apply. Uh, again, uh, it extends the generated code, the default data. Uh, custom object detail, uh, I have moved everything into a map structure, so it's key value driven for all your data. Uh, I got rid of all the POJOs, which I found out was eating up so much memory. Uh, that this path was so much easier to go. The other interesting thing is by going this route, you can actually create custom mappers within your builders. So you can actually override any of these builders and actually do more specific mappers. So you could do a key value, or you could even do go out three pairs and you can actually specify what type of, uh, uh, what type of object type your data is? Is it a string? Is it an integer? And then apply a value to it. Uh, we have our factories, so you can access all your builders, controllers. Uh, I have separated that out to a factories package. There's two ways of doing this with best practice. You can do it this way where everything's self-contained. You can go look here. You know what factories there are, or you can push them back into the corresponding packages. Six of one, half a dozen of the other, uh, just depends which side of the framework uh, universe you fall in. Uh, really best practice, it can be one or the other. Um, I typically like it this way because it's cleaner. I can go in here, I know exactly where uh, my factories are. Uh, let's see, under page. So at the user level at where you can actually customize your test framework, we have modules and we have objects. Now, under modules, this is where you're gonna actually create 
all your page actions for your particular test, for your particular page in your website. So in here, uh, I have things like uh, accept entitlement change, add new certificate, add new payment. So what we do here is we name our methods to our specific actions that we're trying to test on the page. Now, also within here, we have our assertion methods for the actual code for the assertion test. So these all return Boolean uh, and they all start with is expected uh, or is new. So again, it follows the best practice of an assertion and a Boolean method where it always starts with is. Um, and it's gonna return true and false and all of our logic again lives in here. Uh, you can also see we have uh, order detail page objects. So if we actually go into our page uh, or into our page objects folder, in here, we can actually create custom uh, construct or custom uh, constants where we can hard code values that we need to reuse. Now, the reason I want this route is one, when we get to the actual generated code, you'll see that everything else that we do for our pages is actually using an elements. So we're using uh, an actual uh, enum to load our elements and our mappers. Now with the, but there's gonna be cases where we, as a code generator, you can't actually go out and pull out things like XPath, but you can pull out things like ID. The problem you run into even with the sitemap is some page IDs or some page objects don't actually get generated till an action happens. Either you click a button uh, or a frame gets displayed. You have to have some type of JavaScript action or a trigger to actually display something or you may have a site uh, that gets auto-generated on the back end as you're going through the application. So here you can add things like military address and uh, international address, but by default on this particular page, the domestic address is displayed. So I have all the IDs for that, but I need a way of mapping the values uh, for the data to an actual input on the screen so I can interact with it. So that's what the object is for. So again, go back into our um, go back into our model here. So in here we have a lot of different things. So like here you also have populate. So you can, you create specific methods for populating data on the page. You can do it by groupings. Uh, you really don't want to add validation in here. You want the validation to be in the is methods or in your essentially your search and methods because anything you do here, you want to apply a specific assertion to. So if the new order domestic shipping fails, we want to be able to actually write out a valid test failure message that, hey, uh, order uh, new order domestic shipping uh, to same app, uh, applicant did not display uh, or it was not the same. So you actually create your custom uh, reporting messages when the test fails at this level, at the assertions. But you call these methods to do that. So all the specific page logic code lives in the model. Then in our libraries, I give you a couple of different options. We have screenshots and in here, you can create custom screenshots for the different browsers. So I support pretty much everything, Safari, uh, IE, Firefox, Edge, and Chrome. Uh, you have, oh, and PhantomJS. And we have a remote screenshot file. So you can actually take a remote screenshot based on these properties from say a Selenium grid, if you were running remote tests. Uh, I now have code in place where you can actually go take a screenshot from the Selenium grid, pull it back and actually store it with the reporting. Uh, we have our base screenshot file, which extends uh, base screenshot. So here you can uh, add to this interface, which will be applied across the board uh, to these. And then we have the screenshot here, uh, which again applies to the uh, individual screenshots. I do everything by interface and implementations. 
because uh, in these cases, what you apply to one for either of these should apply to all so that everything is on the same page, uh, regardless of if uh, you're Safari or Firefox, as far as how the actual screenshot implementation is applied. Same logic goes for web drivers. We have local and remote web drivers. Um, again, if you're running Docker, you'll configure your remote web driver, or if you're running local, you can create custom local uh, drivers. So like here, Chrome, again, these all extend generated. So here you can override these wrappers uh, and add additional code. Uh, I have custom weights and custom uh, web drivers. So again, here, um, this interface, if you want to add anything to your web drivers uh, implementations, you would add it here, your custom web driver handler. So if you want to change the overall uh, handler for the web driver itself, you would apply it here. Uh, let's see, custom file downloader. Um, I have a generic file downloader that will download uh, files from a web page. Like if you click the download button, it will pull, uh, it will save the file to your specified path. Uh, I have a PDF manager. Uh, this guy's kind of cool. It will read any PDF file. It will pull, it will convert the PDF to straight text. And then it allows you to actually go through that text and verify that the text that uh, you expect to have in the PDF is there. So you can actually put test data in now to actually test uh, PDFs. Uh, custom reporting, uh, this is where you would customize the actual uh, HTML or text um, or XML reporting files that get generated from TestNG. Um, right now, everything is using the base because I pretty much give you a pretty good out of the box solution, but you can customize it based on your organization. Uh, custom spreadsheet reader. If you're using like an older version of Excel or you're using Open Office, you may need to customize the base spreadsheet reader here to do some additional implementations or actually uh, change how you actually read the spreadsheet. So here you would override some of the spreadsheet reader classes. Okay, let's get into the guts here. <clears throat> So in the actual generated code that I provide you, let's start with page. So instead of having objects, we have elements. So when you actually run the generator, what's cool about this is it will actually read the web page and it will actually generate you an enumeration file with uh, wrappers in them. So within each enumeration, you have a method for element type, you have a method for ID and you have a method for key. So anytime I use this element, I can tell you what HTML element type it was. So in this case, this is an A link. Uh, I can also get you the actual ID that was in the field uh, on the web page. So what was stored in the ID value. And then I also store the key, uh, which is the enumeration here. Uh, for our mapper. So I'm actually using the key across the board for when we're loading the data in. Now, I've tried to do it with the enumeration, and if you're pre-Java 8, you couldn't really do that, so I had to use uh, this option here. But with Java 8 and going forward, we can actually now use the enumeration. So this guy might get deprecated and eventually removed, uh, but I started this in Java 1.7, so I wanted to keep the backwards compatibility for now, so key still lives. Uh, but what this means is when we actually go to use it, so if we go look at our modules, <clears throat> so here I can do order detail element, I can do dot denumeration, because within my base class here, uh, or my base methods for the pages, I can pass the elements around. So I can do um, order detail element, I can do dot, I can um, get any of the enumerations that are in that element, and then I can pass the enumeration around, or I can do dot, I can get the element type, the ID, the key, 
uh, and I can use the actual name for two string. Let's see, uh, order element. Uh, I also have a class in here for element type. This contains every single type in HTML4 and 5 so that uh, we actually have a reference to the individual type. This is here because in future versions, the element type is actually going to dictate what actions you can actually do uh, from the base file. So if you're dealing with a link, you can look at the link address, you can validate the link address, you'll be able to look at the link text, uh, but you don't need to worry about um, uh, some other things like you can't input into a link, so you won't have an input option. So basically, I will limit the interactions that you can actually do with the web objects based on the actual type. So you won't be able to do things within your test code that you really shouldn't be able to do with the page object of that type. Let's see, the elements. So the models, so everything extends base model. Base model contains all of our utility classes for interacting with the website. So we can uh, accept alert pop-ups, we can clear web elements based on the list of objects, we can clear individual web elements. We can click pop-up frames, pop-up modules, uh, we can click individual web elements based on the, our enumeration element, uh, off an actual web element or by ID or by XPath. Uh, I have lots of different methods, utility methods in here to handle many different situations. Uh, it may seem like overkill, but there are situations where the test generator just can't do it all for you. And it's really nice to kind of have the ability to just follow the framework, follow the best practice and use the individual utility methods for this. The other reason that this is nice and that I have essentially wrapper methods for everything in Selenium is one, uh, if you try to call something and it's null, I throw a specific message to the error. So you get a null XPath exception, which again, you would go out and look and see what that is uh, in the properties file. However, <clears throat> if you don't do things like this, if you don't wrap the messages within uh, your framework, Selenium or TestNG may throw a generic message that could basically make you spend hours and hours of wasted time just trying to define what the actual problem is before you can actually even debug the problem. So by doing this, I've eliminated about 90% of the overhead of debugging an actual issue within the Selenium or the TestNG framework. Uh, there's still about a 10% gap there, uh, and I'm constantly working on wrapping that more. But uh, this eliminates most of the problems you'll have within any type of test framework if you uh, use this uh, base model utility method, uh, utility class. Uh, we have things like get web element attributes. Uh, some other things that I've wrapped in here. Uh, let's see. Ah, here we are. Uh, so input text in web element. So within our properties files, we talked last time, we have a page element retries in our properties down here. So if we actually go look at our web properties file, in here, we can set how many times we want to retry a page load, reload, um, or how long we want to delay for each page reload, and for each element, um, how many times we want to retry uh, to see if an element is available, if it's displayed, if it's enabled. These are kind of necessary for the base model because of things like AJAX, when you have asynchronous calls and you have to wait on something to come back. Or if you click something and it does a JavaScript call and it changes the visibility of an element on the page, what happens is the whole page becomes um, essentially stale. So because the page itself changed, the references to all your page objects may not be valid anymore. 
And what this essentially does here is if for any reason it fails trying to implement something because of that, uh, it goes back and it essentially does a refresh and it pulls you back up here and you try the action again. Uh, this is a wrapper in all, almost all action methods where you are trying to input, trying to select, uh, or even check to see if an element is displayed or not. Uh, these are just things that you kind of have to do. And there are so many blog posts and so many people struggling with this in the Selenium community that I decided to just do best practice, figure out what the best solution was based on everything I saw in all the groups off the Selenium documentation. And I have put that into this utility class and into the framework. Uh, let's see what else we have. You can check for like is options in the drop down box. So I've essentially eliminated all this boilerplate code that you have to do again and again with Selenium to do certain uh, actions on the page or certain tests into base methods. And by doing so, if we go look at our generated code again, let's go back into our default order uh, detail model. And in here, what I essentially do is if it's a button, I create an automatic method for clicking of the buttons. Because one, I'm adding a wrapper here for reporter. So I'm keeping track of every single click or every single navigation point within the application. And it will send it to the reporter. And when the test is done, you can go look at the uh, test and G documentation, and you will be able to pull up the actual test flow, and you will have a nice little clean document that you could send to the BA and say, okay, this test failed, here was the path of the test, it failed at this point in the test, and then you can go get the data from the spreadsheet or the database and send it along. Uh, this is just all pre-generated. Uh, as you saw before though, in our custom, we can then come in here and do things like add new payment. So here we would select the object, pass in the element, pass in our order details, which is our uh, data object. And what's nice here, this is something else I've added. We go look at this. Oh, wrong one. <clears throat> I've also added a Boolean to most of the actual field inputs or select statements where you can ignore the text if it's null or blank. Now, that may seem weird, but there are a lot of situations where you want to actually test for a null or a blank in an input field. However, there's a lot of times where you don't because the data that you're actually testing for uh, is, um, you want it to fail if it's null or blank. Uh, or other times you may not want to test that field at that particular time. So if you say ignore test if null or blank, it essentially means you're going to skip this. So if the test data uh, is blank, meaning you don't want to input something into this field, you're going to say false. Don't, uh, or if you want to essentially test a failure, you're going to say false. So you're not going to ignore the text if it's null or blank. So when you come in here, so if our data is null and this guy was false, so if we're not going to ignore, uh, it will throw an exception that, hey, you tried to test the field with no data. Uh, if you don't care that it is, um, or you essentially want to test a null value, then you would say true here. Uh, ignore it, and then it'll actually run through the test here. It won't fail uh, at this stage, and it will assume that you wanted to put a blank or a null value into the actual field, uh, which should fail on the test side of things if it's not a required field or if there is no null or blank for that uh, input element. Let's see some other things within the framework. So uh, the generated assertions. <clears throat> we look at our search and implementation. So we essentially have four methods. We have is page displayed, is page links valid, is page text displayed, and a services. <clears throat> so 
So if we look at order detail again, I keep picking on order detail because this is the biggest page within this uh, application. So there's a lot of implementations with this. All right, if we look in here, every uh, page, it's predefined with these methods. So we are automatically checking to make sure that is the page displayed. So we're checking to make sure that all the page objects are there, that are displayed, that we want to be displayed. And if you notice, I'm calling the model that is page displayed. Well, the model that I'm calling is the custom order detail model, which if you look here, default order searching. So it's still the generated. But if I go into the implementation, it's taking me to my custom order uh, detail. It's taking me to the custom code, not the generated code. So if you override this, it will automatically go to your custom code. If you don't override this, it will go to the generated code. <clears throat> and in here, we essentially create an arrays, array list of element types that we want to make sure are displayed. So to make sure that this page is displayed, I will have a new order application first name field, and I will have a new order add cert button. If those two things aren't displayed, it will fail uh, on that assertion, telling you that the order detail page failed to load. Now, if you didn't have that, what you would end up getting is a uh, page timed out waiting for element X to be displayed. And that could have happened anywhere that that particular element was used. So you're not really clear on where the test actually failed. So by following this uh, logic, you guarantee that you will always know where to go uh, to kind of research when the test failed. Uh, another one that's very useful is page links valid. I have a very useful method here uh, that actually will go through the entire page and actually validate all the links on the page. Uh, it checks for the H references and it checks for source. And then it actually goes through and makes sure that all the links exist. And what's, um, I, I took this even one level further. Uh, I checked to make sure that the link's okay. If the link is uh, moved permanently or moved temporarily, I actually walk the path of the URL till I get to the end till I either get a 200 or I get a 400 or 500 failure. So this is uh, something a lot of people miss when they're actually testing URLs. Uh, but uh, I kind of hard wrap this in here uh, and it's a very useful utility to have. <clears throat> and then uh, the last one that you get predefined is page text displayed. Again, typically you're gonna override uh, this within your actual custom code because I'm not gonna know really what text you want to have displayed. Now, I can pre-populate this with what I see on the page initially, uh, and I've started to do that, but I found very quickly that um, a lot of applications are different and that may or may not work. So I'm looking for a toggle flag with the code generator to pre-populate this or not. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? See, that was the models. So our builders. So here we have our JSON reader. So these are the actual files, uh, utility files actually load the data in. So we have our JSON parser, which uh, this guy takes a file name. It takes a uh, list, an array of elements, which if we looked at the default order detail, so here we're passing in the file name and our key if we want to get it within a JSON file. Uh, within uh, random data, it will generate an order detail. So it will take our array and it will just randomly generate data. Uh, with spreadsheet, we actually go into our um, our spreadsheet builder down here. So here, random data, we use the uh, Java Faker, so fake value service, and you can actually generate 
Uh, right now, I'm generating an alphanumeric uh, combination for our data. Uh, there will be other options for this uh, coming, but right now I just want to make sure that this guy worked, and he does. Uh, and then the spreadsheet data goes through the spreadsheet uh, mapper classes, and it actually goes through and it will get the uh, ID and the values in the spreadsheet. Our controllers. Our controllers contain the assertions, the controller class itself, and the services. So we gain access to our assertions and service classes through our controller classes. And in here, it basically creates our new custom order detail. Again, if you look, I'm passing the, or I'm assigning everything by interface, not uh, by the actual um, custom or default classes. Uh, everything pretty much extends or implements an interface, and all customs extend default. So in here, we return our. Uh, services returns the initial elements, and it, it actually generates the custom uh, order detail model class. By doing a lot of this, uh, it's lazy loading. So a lot of these pages won't get loaded unless they get called. So again, it reduces the overhead and memory. Uh, our data objects are really straightforward. We have a get, which returns a mapper list of string, uh, basically key value pair. And the data has a get where we get the actual element enumeration. And we have the one where we can get a specific key and actually get the actual key from the element. Look at our default data. So again, get key. We do data dot get key. So we're actually just getting the value based on the key. And element, it uses element dot key. That's key value pair. <clears throat> Factories, so base builders. Uh, this will generate, be auto generated for you for all your interfaces and all the default uh, methods. Now, you notice I don't have builder at the end. That's because anytime I use a builder or I use a data object, I want to keep it as simple to the page as possible. So I dropped the actual post fix for everything. So you have login, uh, login data, uh, but when you're actually just dealing with the pages, all the methods are the actual page name. I find it comes out to be much cleaner. Uh, base controller factory, same thing here. Uh, when you're dealing with your controllers, again, you're dealing with the at, with actual page method names based on the uh, page name. Data objects, again, uh, I dropped the post fix for everything. Screenshots, just get file. Web driver, you can get uh, your list of custom web drivers. So that could be Chrome, IE, Firefox, or you can add your own uh, and add it to the custom web driver list. Uh, default web driver, I believe I have it set to Firefox. That's in the properties file. The default builder factory, again, just return to all the custom. Uh, wrapper classes for builders, same for controllers, data objects. The only difference here is with the data object factory, we uh, you can hard code within or when you create your constructor, you can pass in the workbook and uh, the Jira issue or sequence number for your actual test. Uh, otherwise, you have to go through the individual data objects. Uh, these, as you can see here, they're also lazy loaded here. So until you actually call the methods within this class, these objects are not populated. These are null by default. I know we're getting close on time, so I'm trying to hurry just a little bit. Uh, our properties files. So Chrome driver properties, this guy's pretty nasty, but it's just an enumeration of every single property tag value that exists in our properties file. So if we go down here and we look at our properties and we look at Chrome driver. 
So there's corresponding enumeration to every single uh, command line property that you can apply to the browsers. And it's different for each browser. So like uh, Edge only has the driver, Firefox has uh, some logging properties and headless. So if we actually go back to our drivers, we looked at Edge, we really don't see any. Firefox, just have the loggers. And I define all the property values here as enumerations. But with Firefox, you actually can call get log types for the logger. These are only the log, um, these are the actual property values that apply to just logging. So headless is not in this list, but I may still want to apply to headless uh, to actually run the browser in a headless mode or not. Chrome driver, same kind of thing. Uh, I've added some additional methods at the bottom to actually get what are considered Chrome options, not command line, but these are, have to be defined as actually uh, options. So all those properties are options, um, i.e. Uh, also has options. So we have, right now these three are options, so you call get options, Phantom.js, uh, you have command line arguments, you have desired capable args. Again, I define all the properties as enumerations, but then I specifically give you methods to return you the ones that you actually need to load for the specific uh, command line argument uh, option or the desired uh, capability or arguments. Screenshots, base screenshot, just get file, take and save get file, get instance of, and base screenshot, and your services just get file. So screenshot file for Chrome, pretty straightforward, take screenshot driver, get screenshot as, and you define the file name. Uh, typically best practice, what I do is uh, I write out the browser type, so it would be Chrome, I write out the page I'm on, or I write out the test uh, name, uh, the test case name, uh, that I'm actually applying, and I write uh, and I append the ID uh, to the file name as well. Uh, web drivers. So we have actual individual drivers. So we have our base driver for Git web driver is the web driver of that type, and then load properties. So Chrome uh, web driver. We have Chrome options. So we get our options. We loop through the Chrome properties that get loaded uh, from the properties file, but we only load the ones, uh, or we only get the values that are options, and we store them into the Chrome driver property. Uh, sorry, we, uh, we actually put them in the options, which is defined here as Chrome options. Uh, get web driver. Uh, with Chrome, you can actually specify 32 or 64 bit. So those are hard coded in our message options. And then based on that, we can then uh, do the setup of Chrome at runtime to be 32 or 64 bit. Uh, and here's our load properties down here. <clears throat> and I also have local and I have remote. <clears throat> So you can define within the message keys where your local Chrome driver files are, where your remote Chrome driver files are. So if you ever need to change these, you change them in your resource file, not in the actual code. So you can actually change this based on your environment. So if you're on production, this could be a production path. If you're on QA, it could be a QA path. Your local environment, this could be your local values. So I wanted to keep this as customizable and uniform as possible. Let's see, we have our weights. I created some custom weights because um, within uh, within Selenium, uh, weights can get kind of flaky if you do them incorrectly. So I predefined uh, some weight definitions. Uh, I also added a jQuery active connection finish so you can actually wait or uh, a jQuery call to make sure that it's finished. Uh, WebDriver handler, 
get driver, set web driver, get web driver handler. Also create your threads locally for your web drivers. File downloader. So this is a downloader utility to just download the file off a web page to your system or remote system. Uh, we went over the message keys already. PDF manager, this is the PDF utility to load, read a PDF file. And what's neat about this guy is I added uh, an additional piece. Uh, right here, get PDF document. So if you actually want to load or you need a PDF file and you're looking for text and the text doesn't seem to be getting found. Sometimes when a PDF document gets exported to text, it will contain special characters that are embedded into a PDF file. So if you actually uh, write uh, or call this get PDF document, this um, and then call load PDF, what this does is this will, um, the load PDF will return the actual PDF document and you can write it out as a string to the console. And then you can actually search for that text that you're looking for and see if there's some special characters in it. If there is, essentially just copy that text straight from that output and put it into your test data. Here's your uh, custom test and G report. So you can actually customize your report here. Uh, well, not here. This is the default one, but you will um, you can customize this uh, these methods in your uh, custom report class. And the default spreadsheet utility is here, uh, pretty straightforward um, from the uh, uh, from the POI uh, API utility, which I'm using for loading spreadsheets. Factories, page objects, models, library. And that's kind of it in a nutshell. So these are all the different things that I've run into that I've applied to the code generator for best practices. So as you can see behind the scenes, there's a lot of different utility things that are uh, really useful when it comes to testing websites. Um, and I put a lot of it into the code generated piece. But for everything that you see here that is code generated, there is a corresponding wrapper for it. And probably in the next iteration, the generated code itself will not be included within the actual project. Uh, it will be in its own jar file uh, within the Maven uh, modules. And then you will just have your custom code to work with. You'll still have the source code, uh, but you just won't see uh, this particular piece here. So you'll only be focusing on what you need to focus on. Anyone have any questions? None here. Nice summary, nice wrap up there. Any quite, it's a quite extensive framework. That's, I think I'm gonna have to take a look at trying to apply this for it, at least a bit of learning because <coughs> I've been wanting to get more into Selenium and I have not. So it, it's nice to have a nice framework to leverage some of those things without having to learn all the ins and outs of everything all at once. So, Yeah, let me know when you get to that point because this is all generated. Um, so th this is essentially using all open source and best practice um, policies for testing and even Java. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I really spent the most time trying to get right was, um, of course, the web drivers, the builders, and loading the, the data. But the big chunk of it is all in this guy here. <clears throat> because I essentially have wrapped just about every single Selenium class that there is um for like select options uh working clicking buttons radio buttons um like links exist so looping through the links uh 
and this is actually, if you look at very carefully, uh, this guy's using recursion. So he's actually calling himself till he hits the end of the path. And uh, it, I have a few other places like this within the code. Things like this where a lot of people that really don't understand Java or if you're just new to testing and not really a Java user, but you know how to test using Selenium, you'll be good using the Selenium piece, but you'll falter on the Java side. You won't think of some of the things like the memory constraints or uh, out of memory errors or things like that, where you would essentially start thinking, oh, it, it's a the application that I'm testing. It's the problem's there when the problem is actually in the test script itself, it has nothing to do with the application. Uh, so I try to eliminate all of that thinking or any of that worry uh, with this framework. Okay. But yeah, and to get all this, uh, all you need is a sitemap. You use my test generator tool and it takes about five minutes and it will generate all this code. And it, it's multi-browser support, right? It's not just... Yes. Yeah, uh, currently I support <clears throat> drivers. I currently support Chrome, Edge, Firefox, IE, Opera, Phantom JS, and Safari. Okay, no, that's that's very good. There, there are enough differences in Firefox and Chrome and how their rendering engines work and some of the things that that's very good to have that level of support there. And even though my uh, properties for Chrome looks nasty, the problem with that is every iteration of Chrome, they add and remove properties for what developers can use. Uh, it's and, and they're not very clear on what is there that you can use. So I want the kind of scorch earth path and decided to include everything. Uh, Cause you never know what they're gonna remove and you never know what they're gonna add or turn on that's already there. But what I did do was though, I did put the most used properties at the top. So like your bit, disable caching, uh, disable GPU, uh, headless. So if you don't want headless, you essentially either comment this out or remove headless. Uh, if you don't want to run incognito, you comment this out or turn this off. But essentially, if you're running a test and you want to just make sure that the application works, which really from a automated test standpoint, you want to one, you want the test to run as fast as they can. So headless is the best way to go. Um, also, if you are running automated tests, typically you're going to be running multi-threaded. Uh, or at least more than one on one particular system. So really you want to run without caching. And the best way to do that is to turn on incognito because in both Firefox, uh, I, uh, yeah, Firefox, Edge, and Chrome, uh, the incognito will essentially create you a fresh tab with no caching, no browser history. And basically it's as if you just open up a new browser. So these two things here are probably the fastest things to get you from like um, bloated testing using Selenium to very clean testing. Uh, the other features you run into uh, is like window size. So if you're running in a headless mode, uh, one thing that I didn't think about when I first started testing, um, automated testing, was window size. So typically most applications work 800 by 600. We actually ran into constraints within uh, our company where some of our applications don't work on ultra wide screens. And I huh. use ultra wide screens and the tests were failing constantly on me. And that's because we have pop-up frames that can't be resized, don't have scroll options. And I've been flat out told that they're not changing that. So, but what I was told is that they support certain um, resolution constraints, and that's where this comes in. So you, you essentially have to tell the browser at load time what is the desired window size to open to. Uh, and when you do that, 
this should fix any of those particular issues. Now, doesn't Selenium also support more of pool type testing where it can be farmed out to multiple locations? Uh, that, yes, that's using the Selenium grid. Uh, and I did a presentation on that way back in the day. Uh, you can go back through the okay. uh, blogs and find that. In fact, that may even be on the ones that Rob just finished putting out because I believe I did it with the Docker uh, implementations. Um, I think I use Selenium for that. Uh, if not, it, it's still on the website somewhere. Does your um, framework work along with that? Uh, not yet, but I've got all the remote resources in place for it. Uh, I just don't have the properties in place yet for what do we need to actually pass to Docker? What do we need to pass to Kubernetes? Um, after I get the database piece finished, um, which I've been told by more than one company that the reason they won't use this framework yet is because I don't support databases uh, for loading my data. Uh, so that's been kind of the higher priority. But once sure. that's finished, uh, yes, I'll be looking at microservices, I'll be looking at grid, uh, and even just running on a remote machine. Certainly. Oh, that looks great. That looks great. I just wanted to ask that because I wasn't certain if that was leveraged in this at present. Uh, it's not at present, but what's interesting about this is you potentially could send everything to a Selenium grid server. So if you actually ran this on a Selenium grid server uh, with a, s a couple of small tweaks, uh, it could theoretically all run through the Selenium grid. The gotcha is you got to make sure that all the remote pieces that I have in here are configured because it will use the remote piece of this. Uh, it, it's just, I, I have it set up to where you could do it, but it's not very user friendly yet. No, I, I, these are just questions of, of interest, not not uh, any particular statement about anything. It's it, oh no no I was just saying that, no that's what I'm saying though is you can do it with this framework currently. You just have to you would have to create your own custom pieces. Sure, but that's just it. That's what the beauty of this because I did everything as wrappers. You could just come up here to the library, go into the web driver, and go into remote customize these and where's the other one? And then the factory. And then inside of here in the web driver factory, uh, you would essentially override this to tell it to go to the uh, grid. Ah, okay. uh, here it is, custom remote. Yeah, so in here you would use this guy and then uh, your test, actually, th was, this was in the last presentation. So in your Java test, uh, Java, on the test side, in the test ng, inside of the listener, you would uh, modify the custom web driver listener in here to handle the Selenium grid configuration. So when you actually run the test, this would uh, this listener here would tell it to use the grid versus your local machine. Okay. Yeah, if you go back, and I don't know if you were on the first presentation I did with this where I went over the test side of things. Um, I recommend going back and looking, rewatching that one and then watch this one again because uh, it's the full package at that point. Sure. Okay, great, no. But yeah, my whole goal with this was uh, a couple of years ago, I used an application called LifeRay. And LifeRay was kind of the open source version of SharePoint. Uh, another company had come out with something that was creating like portals like SharePoint. And their whole idea, or most of their idea was they had wrapper classes for just about everything. Uh, it wasn't perfect. Uh, but it got most of the job done, but there were still cases where we were actually having to catch the uh, HTTP response coming back to load the page and actually inject uh, 
custom code into the source essentially as it was being loaded. So that led me to this approach here where eliminate that and just make sure that everything is fully customizable uh, at the package <laughs> level so you don't have to do any more injections. That would be a much cleaner way, yes. Okay, great. I'll, I, I have intent to be going back through some of these. So, yeah, if you yeah. got questions, just ping me. All right, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We know your time is important. And if you would like to discuss any additional um, questions or comments you have, you can check us out on info at developerner.com. You can check us out on developerner.com slash contact us. We're on Twitter at developerner. And we're also on facebook.com at developerner. Our goal is making every developer better. So please check us out, uh, ask us questions, and check out some of our other videos.